boys used to call me Eddie. Um, I wanted to be called a boy's name and they embraced me as one of them. I was one of them, but I never looked like them. And it's, it's kind of become a metaphor for me in terms of my experience, good and bad in terms of the importance of diversity um, underpinned by inclusivity and that behavioral inclusivity that I think I'm gonna talk about a, a little bit today. It, the comfort of being, I had I had this comfort of being different from a young age because of that, those boys. Um, and even though I knew, knew I looked different, I was accepted. And so I wanna talk about the difference between looking different and being accepted for who you are, which is the diversity piece and actually feeling included. They're two very separate things, but sometimes one of them gets lost. And, you know, I, I, I began to seek out actually opportunities later on in life to be the one that stood out because from such a young age, I stood out and was accepted. And so whether it was, you know, going on match that being the first woman on match of the day, uh, whether it was making sure that I was one of the first athletes to be, um, to, to get a sponsorship with Under Armour as a female athlete, I, I started to seek out opportunities where the door was actually closed and there was a ceiling there, but because I felt comfortable in that, uh, I, I, I always saw them as doors that could open. But that's ultimately because I felt accepted in my difference. You can feel different and feel very um, excluded. And so, you know, whether it's, you know, 2008, back then when I went on Match of the Day as the, as the first female footballer, fast forward to 2020, 2021, there's now several female footballers on um, on TV. So I'd like to think that 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 mentality towards opening doors has has now normalized female football. Normalized what people feel was different is now being included. So diversity wasn't much of an issue for me. My diversity wasn't much of an issue, but in environments, often the inclusivity is the issue. It's the, the, the boys made me feel like my difference wasn't a problem. But a lot of the time in corporate environments, there is a push for diversity. They've realized that diversity is important on the surface. It's the picture, it's the image of the firm, it's the image of the company, it's the image of, of, the, of the brand. But behind all of that, behind the veil, it's really important to have a, a culture of inclusivity and understand what that looks like. It's knocking on the door. It's 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 embracing other people that that don't think, look, behave like you. It's 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 sitting down and and having dinner with people you've never spoken to before. You know, I used to play for Chelsea, and we had players from South Korea, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, America, you know, all over the world, and we we used to practice inclusivity. We would make sure that we understand where each other came from. And it's really important to really stress that because it is an intentional action. It's not something that just comes and follows after diversity. It's something that has to be practiced behaviorally in organizations. I, I, you can have an increase in diversity in terms of the picture, but if you don't have inclusivity, you all, almost have pockets of people that look this look different, but don't actually get along, don't actually foster that import, the importance of having that environment. So I really want to stress that there is no there is no point having diversity without inclusivity. And it sounds obvious, but the inclusivity part has to be the behavioral part, the intentional behavior towards people that look different, people that come from different backgrounds, think differently and sit around the table and in essence, feel like a family, even though you're not, you don't look, you don't look alike. So it's finding out the why, it's finding out why people, um, why people do what they do. It's finding out what, what, what motivates people from being, you know, from being who they are. Asking those questions is really important to understand why you work with the people you work with. It's that inclusivity piece. It's the, it's the piece behind the person that you work with that's really important. So it's spending time with people that look different to you. It's, it's fostering an inclusive culture. It's finding out the underlying motivations. And then you will have the diversity and inclusivity that I had when I was younger, that I looked different, but I was one of the boys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annie. And it's really fascinating to hear you talk 
And I was really intrigued by you talking about um, seeing those barriers. It's a bit like scoring a goal in a way. You think, I see it in front of me, I'm going to smash it. Do you, do you have that sense, or do you think, in, from within, that you, you see something ahead of you? And you, if somebody's saying to you, yeah, you can't do that, it's going to be quite hard. Why do you think you have this urge to say, I can? I think, um, I think I've just always been somebody that sees it as an opportunity and not a risk. Um, you know, yeah, you have to see closed doors as something that can be opened. Um, and it, it, it's risky, but on the other side of that is, is something great. So I, 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 being the odd one out, as I said, from as a youngster, being somebody that, you know, challenged the, the sort of norm, I, I almost went to seek out those opportunities that open the door for others to walk through. Because it does become easier when, when, you, when you do it as a first and then it becomes easier after that. So, um, it's sometimes it's scary, but but I, I think I've been able to be a pioneer in that in that way by thinking of it as an opportunity and not a closed door. Does it frustrate you when you well, moving on to talk about inclusivity? Does it frustrate you when, for example, corporations may put people of diverse backgrounds in an advert, but actually you scratch the surface and find out that actually the proportions of yeah. diversity within the workforce are very low indeed and in fact they're just paying lip service yeah I think I think you're absolutely right it is lip service and it is that sort of it's the picture it's the picture that you see behind the, behind the veil it's not necessarily the culture that that is being addressed um, and I also think people just you know in terms of recruitment of people often you just do the same things and you you fish in the same ponds and and actually, it's about broadening its perspectives. It's about broadening recruitment strategies. It's about saying, if different types of people are involved in the recruitment process, they will see different types of people capable. But it's really, it's really about being conscious about the, the, you know, the diversity, but the culture behind that. When the person comes into work, how do they feel? Okay, I look different. I've ticked that box. But how do I feel about being here? you know how do how do people get along even though they look and, and talk different and they think differently um so it, it it's something that it doesn't frustrate me but i think it's something that needs to be continuously worked on because i think the diversity is is the buzzword that everybody wants to achieve but the, the cultural piece is much more difficult to to establish so if we focus on that piece as well then you, the two come together where you have you know, a rainbow array of different people working together that can get along and mesh. We talk a lot about role models. Who has been your role model? And have you had women giving you a leg up in football to help ease your path? I have so many. Um, I have so many. My, my earliest role models were the Williams sisters, so Serena Williams. Um, my mother is a big role model for me. Um, uh, people like Michelle Obama, um, just pe just women that have really stood on, you know, stood and, and really kind of been pioneers for their respective fields. Um, that really inspires me. It really, it really makes me think anything can be achieved. If you're in an environment that you feel as though you're the only one, you're the first person really, or you're very underrepresented, how do you go about getting allies in a way to help you feel confident enough to really join in and give your all? Because you said you, you felt as though you were accepted. How do you get to that point? Um, I, I, think it's, I think it's not necessarily always for me to, to, to sort of get to that. It's how other people make you feel. So it's, it's, it's reliant on other people to kind of accept your difference. Um, but it's also important for you to be yourself, be authentic self, because that often allows people to say, well, actually, I can't bring you down because you're different. So it is a two way process. But I think a lot of the time with allies, it's a self understanding. It's a self reflection about our biases, our blind spots um, to, to accept other people that may not look or, or talk or, or, or behave like you. Um, I think we all have a responsibility to, to understand how to embrace people that, that aren't, aren't like us. 